If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Revelation. We are going to be looking at Revelation chapter 5. And this morning we talked about the good news of a Savior that has been born for us. And now we are going to go into glory, into heaven, to see that the mission that this child would have to save a people has indeed been accomplished. That the worthy Lamb of God has secured for Himself a people from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue. And so we saw this morning how the angels are coming in and they're breaking into history to sing choirs of songs to this, this child who has been born. And now we are moving up to heaven to see that praise in its full completion with all of the creatures that are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth giving worship and glory and praise to his name. And so we're just like we saw how this moment in history was going to change everything. The child has come, and that was a historical fact. He has come, and his mission has indeed uh, been accomplished. Now we are going to see in heaven how this is verified and true and seen in heaven's terms, in glory itself. And so we're going to move from the manger, and we are going to go up to the throne. Let's begin Revelation 5. Start with me in verse 1 as we read our passage together. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll, or even to look at it. And so I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll, or to look at it. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. What a beautiful passage describing the Savior who has saved his people from their sins. I wonder if you have ever heard of the story of how King Arthur came to be the king of Britain. I know it's a myth. But it's a beautiful story of how this, this, this man came to be deemed the, the worthy man to lead Britain as their king. 
The story goes that Britain had for a long time been without a king. They'd been without a ruler and they were in desperate need of someone to lead the land. But there was a prophecy that said you couldn't just elect the next king to be, but that there was going to be a person who would distinguish himself as a man who was worthy for the task. And the prophecy said that the king to be the person to be the next king of Britain was going to have to do a certain task. There was a stone, and lodged in that stone was a sword. And the person who would be the next person to be the king of Britain would have to take this sword and be able to pull it from the rock. And many tried to pull this stone from the rock, but it seemed that it would not budge. And so the archbishop of the land, who knew that the the people of Britain needed a king, devised a plan to try to make this happen on his own. And he called all the knights of the land, and he called them to come and participate in a tournament that he was holding. And now his idea of inviting this tournament was not so much to put on an entertaining show for the masses as it was to find a strong and mighty knight who would be able to pull out this sword. And that's where King Arthur comes in, but not as you might suspect. King Arthur at this point is just a little lad, and he is going with his older brother to participate in this this tournament that is being held by the archbishop. He was to be the armor bearer for his brother. But when King Arthur got to this tournament, he realized that he was missing something. And so he was going to be in big trouble because he was missing his brother's sword. But he remembered that as they were making their way to this tournament, he passed by a stone. And in that stone, he saw a sword. And so he decided he was going to run back and to go and try to get the sword for his brother. And lo and behold, when he grabbed that sword, it miraculously came loose. This little boy. You thought that a knight would be able to pull out the sword, but no, this small, little, feeble boy was the one who took out the sword. And there is a a, a shock that is going on that, that is telling the audience something. King Arthur did not become a king because he was a mighty and bold and an audacious warrior. He was strong and able to pull out this sword. He became king because he was the worthy person for the job. He was a a child that was destined to be the king of Britain. And now, as we move into our text, we are moving far from fiction. We are moving far from fantasy. But we have a similar shocking image. An angel cries out to everyone who is able to hear in heaven and earth and under the earth. He says, who is worthy to open up this scroll? Who is able to do this task? And he calls our attention to the lion of the tribe of Judah. But as we turn our heads to see who it is that is coming down to perform this task, this task, we are met with a lamb who is coming forward as the one who has conquered and prevailed. So who is this lamb? Why is he deemed worthy to do this task? I want to examine these questions with you. Who is worthy? Why is he worthy? And lastly, we are going to ask, what is he worthy of? Here in heaven, the angel in verse 2 poses a question. Who is worthy to open up this scroll? He is looking for anyone who will be capable of the job. And so we need to ask, why? what is this job? What is he asking for people to do in order to accomplish this task? Why is he focusing on who is worthy? Now this question of who is worthy, how we determine why is this significant, we need to understand the task that the angel is setting up. And the task is not to pull a sword from a stone. The task is to open up a scroll that is sealed seven times. And so we need to understand what do these scrolls represent? What is the task that he is performing? Now, fortunately, when you come to the book of Revelation, this happens to also be one of the most debated aspects. And so I'm just going to pose a, a number of different theories that I brought forward. I'm going to end with the one that I believe makes sense of the most details that are laid out in our text. And the first theory of what these scrolls could represent is to say that these Scrolls represent the rest of what you are going to read in Revelation. In other words, what the task is, is is for the Lamb to open up these scrolls, and it's saying that this Lamb who is opening up these scrolls is worthy 
to usher in the last epochs, the last eras of history as he is going to bring things to its close. And this finds some ground in the book of Daniel. Because Daniel is told, if you remember, to seal up the scroll and to reserve it until the final days, the last days. And so advocates of this view will say, here is a lamb who is now opening up this scroll. If you're looking it up, it's in verse chapter 12 of Daniel. Uh, here is a lamb who is worthy to open up this scroll and to usher us into the final moments of history. The second view of what these scrolls represent is to say that these scrolls represent all of world history from the beginning of time to the very end. And if this is the case, what this text is describing here is that this lamb is the only one who is able to make sense of history. He's the only one who is able to make sense of history from the beginning of time to its very end. You will not understand what history is about until you understand who this lamb is. For all things are from him and through him and to him. The last view, and it's not the most common view, but I believe is the view that makes the most sense of the elements in this text, is to believe that these scrolls represent the very inheritance of God's people. Now let me explain why I believe this makes the most sense of what we are seeing here in the text, because there's a number of elements that I believe are, are, are critical to understanding what is going on in this scene. You have to ask questions about what we are seeing here. The first question I think that we see in this text is, is why does this lamb need to be worthy in order to open the scrolls? In other words, what does worth have to do with the opening up of these scrolls? The second question I think that pops up as we read this text is, is why are we focusing on the redemptive elements of this lamb? That his blood was shed, that he has conquered, and therefore he is able to open up these scrolls. Another question I think we can ask when we look at this text is why is John weeping in heaven? Does he just intuitively understand that something is awry, that something is amiss? Or does John understand that something more significant is at play that is causing him to literally, in the Greek, it says, weep and weep uncontrollably? And the fourth question that I think this text brings up before us is why are there seven seals on the scroll? Uh, what is the significance of these seven seals and what is John trying to portray in saying that the scroll has seven seals upon it? I believe as we look at these questions, you will see that the inheritance view makes sense of what we are seeing here. The inheritance view says all the promises that God has given his church, that he will make a new heaven and a new earth, that he will redeem us from our sins, that he will make us anew and, and live in right relationship with him is bound up in this scroll. This is our portion. The Lord is our portion forevermore. He is our inheritance. And so it, it presents itself that this is what the Lamb is being called to do, to open up this promises for you as his people. So when you ask the first question of, of why are we uh, focusing on the worth of this lamb, I believe a helpful story to understand what is going on here is in the book of Ruth. You remember in the book of Ruth, Naomi and Ruth are, uh, go into the land of Moab. And they live there for some time, and in that time, they are losing everything. There's a famine in the land, and they lose their children. They lose, uh, Naomi loses her husband, Elimelech. And after some time being spent in Moab, she returns back to Bethlehem. But now she is so poor, and she is just a widow, that she is no longer able to hold on to the land that she owned in Bethlehem. And so if you've heard this term before, you'll remember that Naomi needed someone who would be able to buy back that land. And that someone is called a redeemer's kinsman. And this is really the whole plot of, of the book of Ruth, is will this redeemer's kinsman step up to the plate and buy back the land that Naomi is losing? And we see when you come to the Ruth chapter 4 that there's a contention going on. 
between Boaz, who is one viable redeemer's kinsman, meaning he's in the family, he is, he is uh, able to redeem the land, and he is contested with another man who is in the family who could be a redeemer's kinsman. But the main difference between the two and the main contention is that this other redeemer's kinsman is not capable of buying back the land. And that's very significant because the Redeemer's kinsmen needed to be able to afford the land. And so when you ask, why does he need to be worthy? It's a question of, he needs to be capable of performing the task. He needs to be able to buy back, to redeem the people that he has come to save. And that's only one Redeemer's kinsman that can actually do this for the people of God. And that is our brother, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what's being presented in this text. And that it makes sense why John is weeping in heaven. Because he understands that if this lamb, if if there's no one, pardon me, who is able to open up these scrolls, that the people of God are absolutely doomed. And so he is weeping and weeping. And we need to feel the emotion of that. Because he understands if these scrolls aren't open, the promises are not for us. We are not going to know our God. We are not going to be redeemed. We are going to be judged forever. Someone needs to open up that scroll. And so an angel comes to the fore. He says, John, weep no more. Because I got good news that someone is capable of completing the task. And it is the Lamb of God who is worthy to do it. And that's why this scroll has seven seals. Because you will look in the ancient times whenever an emperor or some rich ruler was passing on their inheritance to their children, they put seven seals on the scroll. We have artifacts even today showing the stamp that proves that the inheritance was passed down with seven seals. It's just another way of marking out that this is indeed the inheritance of God's people. And so... The angel tells John, you don't need to weep no more because there is one who is stepping up to the plate. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now this is a title that was given to Jesus. And this title means that he comes from the line of Judah. And this was prophesied all the way back in Genesis 39. You remember when Israel was giving his blessing to his children, he said to Judah, that the scepter shall not depart from his line until Shiloh comes. Which is to say, there is going to be a king in the line of Judah all the way until the king of kings comes, who is Jesus Christ. And this other title, that he is the root of David, points back to his heritage, that he was going to be a descendant of that great king, David, who is in the history of Israel. Jeremiah 23 says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. We have two prophecies that are very clearly identifying for John. That the lamb that you are seeing is the messianic king of all kings. Jesus, who went to the cross, who you followed through your earthly life. This is him who is now standing in glory. Don't mistake his messianic identity. This is the only one who is worthy to come up and to take these scrolls and to open up your heritage, your blessing, your promises for you as God's people. So we've talked about who is worthy. Now we need to understand why is he worthy of doing this task. Verse 5 begins by saying, um, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. This translation, I prefer the translation, He has conquered. And if you look at the Greek, this phrase is actually at the very beginning of the sentence. So you would read, he has conquered the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has conquered to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. This is one of the reasons why he is able to do this tax because he has been victorious. Past tense. 
He has defeated the grave. He has defeated sin. He has defeated the devil. And that is why he is able to step up to the plate and to open up these scrolls. And more than that, it's going to focus on how he did it. Verse 9 says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. That's a why answer, a because answer. Why is he worthy to take the scroll? Because he was slain. And this is beautiful because this has already been portrayed since the very inception of Israel. You remember the story in Exodus of God bringing these plagues upon the Egyptians. And when he came to the 10th plague, Israel was not exempt from this plague. He said he was going to strike down all the firstborn of the land. Unless Israel did what? Do you remember what they had to do? God calls Israel to go and to take for themselves. Each family was to take for themselves a lamb. And they were to take this lamb into their household. And they were to care for this lamb until the night when this judgment was going to come upon Egypt. And when that happened, they were to take that lamb and they were to slay that lamb. And then they were to take the blood of that lamb and to smear it on the door. And only because of that, a a task that they did, were the Israelites saved from the angel of death who came and struck down every firstborn of the land. And that practice became standard for Israel. Israel would sacrifice many more lambs. And that is significant, not because of all the blood of these lambs, not because of all the blood of, 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 of what they had done in their sacrificial system, All of those sacrifices pointed to this one singular lamb that you now see in heaven. Isaiah 53 makes the explicit connection that this lamb was going to be a man who was going to be bruised, who was going to be crushed. And Isaiah 53 says he's going to sprinkle his blood on many nations. His blood is going to be the covering for which people will not have to endure the wrath of God to be judged for their sins, but can be delivered from it. And this is why this lamb is able to open up these scrolls because he has redeemed us. He has bought us back by his blood. It is this blood that has been able to redeem you, to make you safe, to make you reconciled with your God. It is this blood that has saved us from our sin. And what an unusual means and beautiful means of conquering. Where most kings who conquer others will do, throw, do so through military means, through arms, through men, through violence, through sacrificing the lives of others. This lamb was going to conquer by offering his own life in saving for himself people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And that's what we next see in this song, that they say, hey, you want to see the proof that this has worked? Look at who is joining in on the praise. If you look at verse 9, it says, uh, you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation." Every one of these people have been accounted for, have been redeemed by his blood. If you look closely at this text, it's very interesting. Because the words tribe and people were two terms that were most often used for the Israelites. And the words tongue and nation are two words that are often used for the Gentiles. And so you have here in a consummate uh, a picture, both Gentile and Jew, that has been reconciled by the power of his blood and are singing praise and glory to our God. Here's the proof that his redemption has indeed worked and has brought together all the people of God that he has redeemed for himself. He has ransomed these these people. So what the child that we saw in the manger this morning, what he set out to do when we look here in heaven, We see that everything that his mission and purpose was for has indeed come to pass. And that's why we are giving glory and praise to God. you got to love all the past tense language in this text. He has already conquered. He has already redeemed. He has made you priests and kings of our God. He's already done all of these things. 
And so may I reach out to you once again and say, if you have not looked to this lamb, you have no hope of having that curse that lies over your head being broken. In Adam, we have fallen. We have lost our inheritance. We no longer have a right to live with God anymore unless we believe in the Lamb who has come to purchase us back, to purchase our redemption, and to make us stand in right relationship with Him. He is able to break that curse. He is able to say weep no more. He is able to usher us into the gates of heaven by the power of His blood. And all of heaven is glorifying God to this end and for this reason. Come to him, know him as your personal savior. So we've asked how, who is worthy. Now we've asked why he's worthy. And lastly, I want to consider just for a short time, what is this lamb worthy of? And to put it in short, it is absolutely everything. Look at verse 6. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures... And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Here in the midst of heaven stands this lamb. Let me read you a quote from Dr. Beeky. He says this lion lamb is not only at the center of heaven, he is the center of heaven. And all of heaven is focused on him. All the worshipers surround him and look to him, beginning with the Father, whose deepest delight is in his Son. He is at the center for who he is and what he has done. He has conquered, and all of heaven is rejoicing. And so now all of heaven is going to break out in praise. And we hear a new song being sung, verse 9, and they sang a new song. And that's beautiful language. Because when you look through the Bible and you look at when this term is used for a new song, it is always following a glorious scene of redemption. So you remember when the Israelites were taken through the Red Sea, we read of how Miriam and the woman began to sing a new song for the redemption they had just experienced, that God had delivered them from their enemies. He had set them free and he had brought them through the Red Sea safely to the other side. And now all of heaven, when they see what this lamb has done, that he's given himself for our sin, that he has accomplished redemption on behalf of his people, they are singing a new song. Worthy is this lamb of absolutely everything. They are singing praise and glory to his name. Now watch the building cascading effect as the song progresses and we hear everyone take on their lips praise to his name. We begin the first song with the 12 elders and the four living creatures in verse 8. And they're singing, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. But then we move and we see all of the angels begin to join in on this song. And so you'll read in verse 11, they heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. No angel is going to miss out on this moment. They are all in full gusto praising and glorifying this lamb. You know, the angels are constantly looking into the redemption of God and giving praise to him for what he is doing. Let me read another quote from Dr. Beeky. He says, angels, we are told are spectators and subordinates in the drama of salvation. And they are deeply interested in the salvation of sinners because they deeply love God. And the Bible tells us that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels in heaven over one sinner who repents. And when you were saved, tens of thousands burst into song. And they were happy, perhaps happier than you were, because you hadn't fully understood at that point all that had happened to you. But they, they rejoiced. And that's why we see all of the angels breaking out in glory to the Lamb. He has done it. He has redeemed his people. He's worthy of our praise. And so we move from the 24 elders to hearing all of the angels to literally hearing every creature that has breath in them giving praise to God. It ends in verse 13, in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and 
all that are in them. I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Every creature that is given breath, as Psalm 150 speaks of, let all that has breath praise the Lord. They are not missing out on this event. All of creation was designed to bring praise and honor to his name. And so when we speak of the worthy Lamb of God, worthy literally is a term that speaks of the balancing out of the scales. And if you put the Lamb of God on one side, and you put all that praise and glory and blessing and honor and glory that is being given to God by angels and creatures that are in heaven above, to the earth beneath and under the earth, all creatures that are ever made, bringing out through heaven praise to his name, you put that on the other side and you will never outmatch the infinite worth of this son. That is the worthy Lamb of God that all of heaven is praising his name for. He is worthy of all we can give him. And that speaks to us today. He's worthy of your heart. He's worthy of your soul. He's worthy of your strength. He's worthy of your attention and love to him. When you're trying to disciple your children, when you're trying to put in extra hours of service in the church, he is worthy of absolutely everything we can give him. You know, there's a movement called the Moravian Movement. It's a missionary movement that would send thousands of missionaries throughout the world. It started by Nicholas van Zinzendorf. But at the heart of this missionary movement was a motto that they kept repeating to themselves. And it came from two missionaries who would take a one-way ticket and they would sell themselves to go to an island where they knew they would never be able to return. And they would be speaking to people who have never heard the gospel. But they took these tickets and they boarded the ship. And as they were waving to their family and their friends goodbye, they said, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive the reward of his suffering. And that movement was what caught fire and sent many other missionaries to say, he is worthy of our time, he's worthy of our praise, he's worthy for us to go out to the nations to declare his name. The people who have caught a sight of this worthy Lamb of God have been so motivated to speak for his glory and for his name. Jesus, as we have said this morning, was not some ordinary teacher or some ordinary philosopher. He's not some ordinary man. All of heaven revolves around this Lamb of God. And so we too ought to give our lives and our service and our praise to his name. This is the infinitely worthy Lamb of God. John, you don't need to weep no more. And you can say that to yourselves this day. Susan, Emily, Mark, whatever your name might be, Timothy, weep no more. For you have the Lamb of God before you who is able to redeem you from the curse, who is able to buy you back and to bring you and make you priests and kings of your God. Weep no more, for there is one who is able to redeem us from our sins. His name is Jesus, and he is the Lamb of God, who heaven has not stopped speaking about to this day. And one day we will join all of the ranks in singing praise and glory and honor and blessing to his name forever and evermore. Amen and amen. Let us go before his name uh, and praise him for what he has done. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you loved us to the point of sending your son. As John said, here is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Now we see in heaven, here is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of his people and redeemed them by the power of his blood. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would live for his name. We pray that every breath would be used to praise and glorify his glorification glorious name. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would want to tell the world, we'd be moved to tell all of those around us the good news that he has come. He is our Savior. We know him. We love him. And we want you to know him yourself. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would make us uh, praise and worship you just like the angels in heaven so that you fill our eyes, you fill our hearts, and you fill us with all joy to know you as our King. We pray these things by the power of the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.